So before I start, we had a, we've had a really interesting conversation in our office recently. We had a client who objected to the use of the term diversity, um, and it, it raised uh, a, a really interesting discussion about you know what is the difference, what is diversity, what is inclusion, and what should we be using? And and while different people will have different views on this and have di their own definitions, for us, what we've determined is that diversity is what you have. It's the state of, of things, and you know our our goal should be to have as diverse a uh, situation as, as possible, but inclusion is what you do about it, is what are the actions and steps that you're, you're um, utilizing, you're integrating into your thinking or into your, into your work uh, that is encouraging greater diversity. And so um, while maybe perhaps not a perfect uh, definition, uh, for us it's, it's, it's really important in terms of helping us understand how we can be more intentional uh, in, in, our, in our work. So, HCMA based in, in Canada, in western part of Canada, uh, do work uh, in primarily for public sector clients. And so it, it, we're very fortunate to, to, to do mostly that type of work. And it's really shaped our thinking because our clients are at their core about the public good, about the social, social good. So we're, we're about 100 people, which is, which is a really handy number uh, when you're comparing and you're, you're looking at, at ratios. Uh, and we're about 56% we're about women, um, which I, I really do think is significant. And there isn't a day in the last four or five years where we've been less than 50% women. And in a profession that has got some serious and continues to have some serious challenges when it comes to gender uh, inclusivity, um, I, I believe that... Um, um, it's important to lead by example, and it's important. I think it helps to shape who we are, and it really shapes uh, our, our our work as well. When we th look a little bit more closely uh, in, in leadership positions, we're not quite as balanced. We've got 28 leadership roles, and 46% of those are women. So we're not. And if you look further, you look at the partner level. Of course, uh, we're not we're not quite as balanced as well. So uh, obviously. Uh, we're on a journey like, like, like everyone else, but um, we really are trying to create a culture that is diverse and inclusive and, and welcoming as, as, as possible uh, as well. But when you think about uh, disability and, and you think, how many people within HCMA express as, as, as physically or as having a disability? And this is an interesting one because when you look at 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 our firm, um, you know I'm hard pressed to to identify anyone that expresses directly as as having let's say physical uh, mobility challenges, and yet we know when we think about um, the the stats and we look around us in society um, that. Um, there are many people within our within our community, within our firm, that have barriers every day coming into work, and 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 we're probably not that aware of them. We're probably not sensitive to them or thinking about them. Um, but that that's that's an important thing for us to reflect upon because not all barriers are visible. Many, in fact, are not. And. Um, we all have challenges th throughout our, our life at various stages, and um, it requires us to to really. Um, intentionally um, uh, try to be empathetic and try to uh, be accommodating of people not only once but throughout all aspects of, 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 of who they are and, and through, through, their, um, through their life. So anyways, that's a, a bit of a, a background on who we are and I think it's important to start by sharing who we are uh, because when you're talking about trying to create a more inclusive uh, and, and diverse uh, society, you really have to look at yourself first and think, well, how are we mirroring that? How are, how are we behaving that is encouraging uh, that within our community? So we're a purpose-driven firm. Uh, our purpose, which we state very clearly, is, is to maximize our uh, positive impact. And there's, there's a few moments uh, in our history uh, where the need for this or the relevance of this uh, is, is highlighted. And, and the first example I want to share with you is a project that I was the project architect on about 22 years ago. Um, uh, is Walnut Grove Community Center. So uh, I put my blood, sweat, and tears into this project, worked long hours, um, and it was incredibly proud of this project. It was highly successful, won lots of awards, um, community loves it, all sorts of accolades, got to you know, um, bask in the glow of a project success. 
And then, and then one day I got a, a letter, a handwritten letter from a mother who um, th congratulated me on the project and said, beautiful project, my neighbors love it. I just thought you should know that my daughter can't use the facility. And she went on to describe how, given the particular nature of her barriers or challenges, she couldn't use the facility. And, and this, I was recently a father, had a young daughter at the time, and so this hit me really hard. This, this really hit me, and I started questioning, I said, well, but I followed the rules, I followed the codes, I did all the things you're supposed to do. How come, um, how come I'm excluding people? And so uh, for me personally, and I, and I know for others, um, it, it, it led to a need to really look for other solutions and, and to go beyond the rules and to go beyond the codes and, and find ways and look for strategies where we can um, uh, just ex include as many people as, as possible in, 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 our, in our projects. So another motivator is the importance for us to stand up and say there's certain things in our, in our world that we have to say enough that are simply no longer acceptable. I'm gonna share a couple of examples with you about, about some of the things that we just simply can't accept as being appropriate. So there's a library uh, in China um, that opened about a year ago um, that when it opened created an incredible stir on social media and all the design blogs. And, and you read all the comments and people are just going on and on and on about how, how incredible this project is. And then you look more carefully and putting aside the fact that all of the books and those images are, are fake, at the very core of this project is, is a concept, is a, con a conceptual approach that is exclu exclusionary. And we simply can't celebrate that. We can't look past that and too often as, as designers, we get seduced by an image, we get seduced by something unique and we stop seeing what's right in front of us. And we should be standing up and saying, are you kidding me? This is not acceptable. That's not an acceptable response to today's challenges. We need to be willing to do that. We need to do that more often. So this is your everyday bank machine. It happens to be a bank machine that I used in North Vancouver for over 10 years. And, and then one day, I was getting some cash, and I, I realized that the, the teller on the right-hand side had a little wheelchair symbol above it. And I said, well, that's interesting. I hadn't noticed that before. And I started thinking, well, what, how is it that I didn't, I've been using this for 10 years, and I didn't see that these were different, right? So I started looking more carefully, looking at the teller, looking at the situation, recognized that the only difference was that one of them was installed an inch lower, and that created an accessible teller. And I started saying, well, wait a minute, like, why not just install all of them an inch lower? Like, I, I used them for 10 years interchangeably. There was no limitation for me. Why not just make them all accessible? Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that is about attitude. That's about not saying, well, I've responded to a requirement. It's like, why don't you make them all accessible? Now, I should say, when I shared this uh, in Denmark, I got the response that I normally get, which is, of course, you know, why don't we just make them all accessible? And then afterwards, I was talking to somebody from the sort of Danish equivalent of the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and I was educated on the fact that that particular barrier, the people that are suffering from muscular dystrophy or living with muscular dystrophy, for them, once you sort of get in a, in a lower position, getting back up again is really challenging. And so for them, actually, it would have been important that one of them would be much higher. And it was such a, it was such a stark uh, reminder for me that even in my way of looking at trying to create a universal response, it can be exclusionary as well. And it, it highlights just how complicated this subject matter is uh, to deal with as well. So not all barriers are necessarily obvious as well. I think we're, we're becoming increasingly aware of uh, particularly around kids with autism or, or people with autism, how the sort of uh, cacophony of impulses and, and things that people are exposed to in the built environment, whether it be light or, or sound, can be a barrier. And we need to think about that. We need to, we need to respond differently and find ways to not exclude people uh, as well. And just be more thoughtful about, about a wider range of challenges. Another example uh, that's, that's relevant is, is, is this um, 
food court uh, near our office um, where if you can manage to get in through these heavy doors, uh, you're confronted with, with this sign that explains to you how, if you're disabled, how you'll, you can access uh, the building, which might be okay, might seem fine, until you realize that the accessible entrance that they are trying to point you to is two blocks away, right? So I'm sure it meets code. Code's inadequate. It's completely unacceptable that somebody in a wheelchair who needs another way of accessing a public spaces that need to go two blocks away to gain the same access that an able-bodied person can come to. We have to say no to that. We have to stand up and say, if that meets code, then the codes need to change. Certainly our standards need to change. We can't, we can't tolerate that. And so it brings me to this, that really building codes are the worst, right? And what I mean by that is they're, they're the worst we can do. If we don't, there's no, no credit for meeting the code. If we don't meet the code, we're, we're practicing illegally. We, we have to think as the code is the absolute worst we can do. And what is it can we do beyond that? What is it should we be doing beyond that? Because building code compliance is not enough. It, it, it's the starting point. And accessibility, as we've traditionally thought of accessibility, is, is not enough as well. Simple participation I is not enough. Is, are you allowing people to be full participants with dignity? And that, that requires uh, compassion. That requires thinking very differently about our responsibility and, and, and imagining different ways for people, um, uh, the, the different needs that people have in participating. So, you know, oftentimes you'll hear, well, yeah, but it's only 1% or it's a small number of people. And then you start thinking, yeah, well, maybe, but people change throughout their lives. They have different needs. They're young, they're old, they might get injured. They know people, they have friends, they have family. You know, the, the people that are affected by the, the barriers in our society is, is far more prevalent than we as designers appreciate and recognize in our day-to-day in our -day work. So a recent Angus Reid survey uh, highlights this, where 24% of Canadians uh, express that they're dealing with a vision, hearing, or ability, disability, or challenge themselves. So when you think about our 100 people, and if, if we reflect, it means that 24% of our firm um, are, are having some sort of challenge that we're not maybe as sensitive to as, as we could be. Another 30% may felt that they didn't necessarily have a, a personal issue, but somebody close to them, a family member, a friend, is, is that, that, that they are concerned about uh, are dealing with these issues. And then another 32% are concerned about how these things might influence them and affect them in the future. So it's, you know, 86% of Canadians are, are concerned about this issue, right? It's not a 1%, it's not a small number. It, it's actually, it's the public, it's the community, it's, it's all of us. Um, and, and when you ask them further, you ask them, do they believe, do they want uh, an accessible uh, country? Um, and I think it's so important that 92% agree accessibility for people uh, is a human right. It's not a privilege. It's a basic human right. Um, however, you said that, I'm shocked that only 70% of people say that new buildings should be universal, universally acceptable. I, I don't know how that's acceptable. That should be 100%. Um, so anyways, but it, what it tells you is it's not a, it's not a small number. This is an issue that has not had enough attention um, in, in, our, in our world. So what are some of the actions? What are, what are some of the things that we're, we're doing and we think need to be done to address this challenge? And the first is to think more broadly about inclusion and barriers to participation. Traditionally, our, our regulations and our rules have been focused on physical and a, our lowest common denom denominator understanding of physical uh, challenges. But we know that the, the types of issues that people are dealing with and the barriers that, that they face are way more diverse. So what are we doing to deal with that? How are we thinking about that? How are we thinking about socioeconomic barriers? How are we thinking about gender barriers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? There's just so, so many. And part of how we respond to that is listening to those and learning from those that are actually living, living these experiences, that are, that are dealing with the, um, the, the barriers within our, our society on a, on a daily basis. There's a couple of examples of that that are, I think are so important. So a number of years ago, it was after the Walnut Grove experience where we really started saying, no, we have to think differently. We have to find different ways of integrating 
uh, strategies to work, uh, came upon an individual from a hard of hearing organization that explained to me the principle of a hearing loop and how a hearing loop could be integrated into a space like this very economically uh, as a way of improving um, accessibility for those that have hearing impairments. And um, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable because it's literally one of the cheapest things we can do. It's essentially a, a ring of conduit, plastic conduit in the space or in the floor or in the wall. Like we throw conduit on drawings for everything, right? So moving forward from there, we've started to integrate hearing loops uh, throughout our projects, indoor and outdoor. Whether or not the clients use them or not, it's hard to say. But it's, it's such an easy thing to do. There's no reason not to do it. We should, this should be a standard practice in every single one of our public spaces in our, in our buildings. Um, and if it's not, it, it really needs to be. And another learning is, for those with visual challenges, how uh, hard it is to navigate spaces that use potlights and how that creates conditions that are very disorienting and how we should avoid the use of potlights in, in hallways and corridors. It's, it's about experiencing these spaces with people with challenges, going around and understanding and seeing firsthand. You get so much better understanding of the issue when you're experiencing it together and when you're, when you're understanding those, those, uh, those barriers. We also have the responsibility to cause change ourselves and to think differently. And one of the examples of, of where we've, as, as a firm, have really pushed thinking is around the use of universal change rooms in, in swimming pools over the last 20 years. And for a bit of context, when we go back to the early 90s, the Eileen Daly pool in, in Burnaby had the traditional arrangement of gendered men's women and then what we at that time thought of as family change rooms um, as, as sort of a third equal cohort. But what we've recognized and, and seeing the evolution that we've been at the forefront is really pushing a new notion of universal change and an idea that meets a broader range of needs, not eliminating gendered change, but really focusing on, on universal change. And what it is, it's a, it's a strategy that allows for a large open space where changing can take place, uh, meeting a wide range of needs, whether they be um, familial needs, individual needs, uh, just an increasing societal desire for privacy. Um, with, with flexibility that will allow for adaptation over time. And they highlight openness and, and transparency in ways that people can really uh, feel connected to their community and feel safe and secure through sort of passive surveillance. And, and that extends out onto the pool decks as well where the locker spaces are allowed then to become open. And, and as a result, far less uh, likely to have uh, theft incidents and, and situations of that nature, which have, again builds a sense of safety and security. And all of these things have tremendous la lasting benefit in, in communities. And so we've been at the forefront of evolving uh, this as, as a building type uh, uh, component. So it's an example of, of causing change. And many of these ideas have, have spread into other, other, uh, other work uh, as, as well. Fourth action is about sharing, um, and we really believe that we gain so much more when we put ideas out into the world. Our Designing for Inclusivity document, which puts forward a whole series of design strategies uh, for gender neutrality in public buildings, particularly around public washrooms, um, is an example of that, is, is you know, bringing our ideas together, adding research, adding expertise, and putting it out in a really creative and engaging way so that we can help uh, others uh, in this area as well. So if you're interested, this is available for download on our website, but it is, uh, it goes step by step through different strategies in different ways. And what, one of the things we've learned from this, which is really an important reminder, is that uh, while it might be focused in, around how do we create gender neutral spaces, it's really better for all. It's creating environments that uh, allow for all members of the society and the community to participate, uh, not, for, not for a few. And, and, and that, that's, that's a really uh, important um, thing to, to uh, remember. The fifth is, is, is the importance of, of policy and how uh, you can really leverage your impact through policy change. We are currently in, in, uh, involved with the City of Vancouver on a universal inclusive design study where we've gone and looked through a series of categories at their existing stock of facilities, helping them on a building by building basis to develop and understand where they're weak, where they need to be improved, and, and ultimately creating a strategy uh, that will, will help the transformation of the, the stock of, of buildings. 
Another action is, is to collaborate, how important it is that when we work with others, and we've been working with the Rick Hansen Foundation on uh, their accessibility certification uh, system, uh, which we're, we're happy to participate in. So uh, you likely know the Rick Hansen Foundation. Uh, Rick Hansen, the man in motion, went around the world in his wheelchair in the, in the 80s and then has really become a strong advocate for the voice of, uh, in particular, physically disabled uh, as well. But their program goes beyond that. Um, and it really is about encouraging meaningful access. It's, it is about access with dignity. It is about uh, going far beyond the, the, the building codes uh, as well. And it's created, they've created a certification and rating system um, that we not only participate in, but we've been an advisor to and have done research on as well. Much like other rating systems, it breaks down the issue by a number of different categories. Uh, and then through a point system and a scoring system, you see the, the level of, of certification. Now this is, it's new, it's relatively new, uh, heavily focused on British Columbia right now, and it's spreading across uh, the country uh, as well. In the research that we've been doing with the Rick Hansen Foundation, one of the things that's been really interesting is to recognize that code compliance on its own only gets 36% of the points available or needed uh, in the program, very directly uh, highlighting that the building code is literally the worst we can do. Um, but also that you can achieve a 72% rating, which is almost the gold level certification, by simply paying attention by doing the things that don't have added cost, don't add added area, but they're really about awareness and understanding and in being intentional in our work. So really, there, there's no excuse for any architect to design a building that doesn't meet the certified level of accessibility that goes far beyond the code. There's no added cost. And frankly, to reach the gold level of certification, what our research is showing that on average, it's 1% cost increase to reach a gold level of, of uh, accessibility certification. And given how often we deal with ones, twos, three percents in our projects, um, that's really not that hard. And it, it's about um, recognizing the potential, recognizing the voids, and, and doing what we can to, to fill them. What does this mean for us? Um, a current project, the Mineral Center for Active Aging, um, situated in Richmond, British Columbia. Um, it's a really important example for us on this subject matter because it brings together um, a, a diverse community. It, res it, it provides services for an older adult as well as the broader community. And in a Canadian context where the older adult now outnumbers children, um, this is increasingly important and, and, and relevant. And we also know that the needs of the older adult today are very different than they were in the past, and they're going to continue to evolve. So, th so this project um, is situated uh, in, a, in a park. It brings together three uh, former buildings, relocates them, integrates them, and in a, in a sort of tight urban configuration, connects them both to the civic precinct and to the park beyond. And it opens itself up into those spaces, providing a very welcoming uh, experience as well. It brings together the older adults or senior center, the aquatic center and, and field house functions on two levels in a way that's quite flexible and allows for shared use and adaptation and change o over time. So some of the things that we did in this project that are, that are relevant to this topic starts from simply how do you get into the building? All of the entries, uh, we use s gradual slopes, gentle slopes, so not ramps, just gentle slopes to get to, to the primary entries. So the first step of getting into the building uh, is, is barrier free. And then once you're inside, your access to the amenities is, is barrier free. And then once you get further inside, things like access to public washrooms, again, is done without doors. Um, so we just minimize the number of barriers just in your basic functioning within. So that's the starting point. The pool, there's some other aspects that are, that are relevant uh, to this as well. And of course, I'm only sharing a, a, like a, uh, a sliver of, of the comprehensive set of strategies that we're using, but there are a couple I want to talk about. And so the first is the uh, change rooms themselves. I mentioned the universal and the evolution of the universal change room. In this instance, we've got 77% of the area is, is focused on universal, including both fully accessible um, private uh, change cubicles. And then there's a specialty room that's, a, that's, that's fitted out with a much, uh, to respond to a much um, 
more demanding need of, of, of change uh, with change tables and lifts and other types of amenities. The pools integrate transfer edges on, on many sides, which allow for different ways for people to access uh, the, w the water, which you see here in this image in the pool in the foreground with this, the transfer edge of the pool, which allows somebody in a wheelchair to sort of uh, transfer onto the edge of the pool and then swing into the, into the pool. Other pools uh, access is both through lift and, and ramps into the leisure pool and into the, into the hot pool as well, similar to what you see in, in this. And ultimately then there's lift points uh, in various other places as well. So there's multiple options and different ways for people to access the pools. Another type of inclusion that we're dealing with on these types of projects is cultural uh, inclusion as well. We're seeing an increased uh, demand for privacy swims. This tends to be uh, women's only swims and it tends to come from communities uh, where for whatever um, cultural or ethnic uh, perspective, they're looking for, for a higher level of privacy. And so our design uh, integrated a number of aspects which allowed for specialized change rooms, adapting the outdoor field house change rooms for, for a different type of purpose, uh, and through screening, uh, the, the separation of the pool which allows for privacy swims. This is something that we're seeing more and more in our projects and that we need, it's challenging us because we've long believed in these very open and transparent uh, pools. And there's lots of reason for that and value in that, but it is coming up against these challenges around, around these very real and uh, legitimate needs for increased privacy as well. So we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to determine how to deal with that. So final thoughts. First is we need to think more broadly about inclusion. The traditional way of understanding it through you know, primarily physical uh, challenges is, is not adequate. We need to recognize the much wider range of and diversity of, of challenges that people face in, in, in living day to day in the built environment. And we need to change our attitude. It really starts with, with architects, designers, those people that are, that are shaping these spaces to not accept the status quo, not to accept the minimum, but to really hold ourselves to a higher level of accountability when it comes to meeting these, these, these needs. We also need better and, and more consistent standards. You know, one of the things we're really hopeful with the Rick Hansen uh, certification program that is gonna drive, it's gonna help elevate, much like LEED has done in environmental sustainability and has caused market transformation. We're really hopeful that through the Rick Hansen Foundation, we'll see a similar market transformation uh, as, as well. We need to research, collaborate, and share, much like other aspects of, of the built environment and aspects of our work. We need to apply that type of creativity and thinking to issues of inclusion uh, as, as well. And, and finally, that you know, responsible design, uh, integrating this type of thinking, really allows um, all individuals. It, it's not for a few. It's, 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 for, it's for all, and that uh, when, when we're thinking more broadly, we're actually making things better for, for more of, of the community. And, and, and one final thought is that at the end of the day, uh, we have to change the rules. We have to change the way we're thinking. We cannot apply uh, our current regulatory framework uh, in, in our work. It just simply isn't enough. It, it does not provide a level of inclusion uh, that uh, is acceptable uh, in our society. Thank you.